You're probably used to being called a massive legend, aren't you? But it is true. The only tr thing is, of course, is that legends just shows the amount of time which has passed. And uh, it was quite a long while ago when, uh, obviously, I first jumped on a motorcycle and then uh, had that first experience in a car. Unfortunately, we've only got 20 minutes. I'd like it to be 20 hours. Um, 50 years ago, you made the move from motorcycles uh, into cars. Seven times world champion uh, in motorcycles. Why did you want to change? Um, it all came about by accident, actually. Uh, I had uh, thought that I'd just continue with motorcycling, but uh, my team I was with uh, decided that they wanted to restrict me in the number of races I did. Uh, instead of doing uh, sort of uh, 30 or 40 races a year, they wanted to stop me doing any private races like Silverstone, Scarborough, uh, Cadwell Park, etc. Because on those races, I used my own machines, my Nortons, and the Italian press said, Certes doesn't need an MV to win. So MV Augusta said, one moment, you must only ride an MV and you only ride in championship. Well, the year before, I had been sitting at a table with Mike Hawthorne, uh, who had just won the world championship, and Tony Vanderveld, who had also won the world championship with the Van World car, uh, and uh, Reg Parnell, and he was team manager of Aston Martin. And uh, Mike Hawthorne, who was a motorcyclist as well, uh, from a point of view who liked to ride a trials bike, turned around and he said, try a car, they stand up easier. You know, so uh, I, said, I said, well, no, no, I'm a motorcyclist. But when this problem came about, I thought, ah. And uh, I'd had a test uh, with Reg Parnell in the Aston Martin uh, just after that uh, me first meeting. And he'd offered me a contract. He said, a contract? I said, no, no, I'm a motorcyclist. But when this problem came up, I thought, no, there's nothing in my contract to stop me driving a car. So I can do my races selected for MV Augusta and I'll do some car races. Uh, so I went over to John Cooper to buy a Formula 2 car. And out of the shadows stepped uh, rather tall, gangly gentleman who happened to be Ken Till. He had just formed a Formula 3 team and he told me, he told me, he said, I've entered you at Goodwood. Uh, the car will only be ready in the days before the event. He said, so we haven't got time to test, but I know you know your way around Goodwood because you drove the Aston Martin. He said, and uh, I've spoken to the uh, RAC, which was the MSA at that time, they will give you a license and view whether you're safe to uh, actually compete. So I went there and I saw my first ever car race from a cockpit. Uh, I put it on pole and then I had a big dice with uh, Jimmy Clark in the works Lotus and uh, just came out second best on that occasion, uh, largely because I forgot that I had four wheels. Uh, for a while and uh, rather passing someone I used with too much grass and uh, bogged myself down but that was the start of uh, my car career two races later uh, Colin Chapman rang me up and said drive a Formula One so I went and tested a Formula One and uh, then when I was not racing a motorcycle uh, Colin said you drive the Formula One uh, team and so that was it. Did you like it? Did the, was the sensation a nice one, driving a car? Or did you think, oh, I'll just have to get used to it, I'll have to like it eventually? Did it, did it just feel right straight away? I think that uh, I've been very fortunate in life in that I've actually been able to sort of follow my heart to a degree uh, in that I first love was motorcycling and I was all involved in tinkering with them and putting them together and then seeing if they went by riding them. And uh, I came together with those machines and was able to be very competitive. Uh, when I came together with a car, this was a massive challenge. This was a new horizon and uh, no, no, it, it was worrying because of course I went in at the top end. Uh, I say my f uh, fourth drive ever was in a Formula One. And so uh, I sat on the grid 
in Monte Carlo. I then put it on pole uh, for the Portuguese Grand Prix. And then I came back and was second in the British Grand Prix. But this is all within the first sort of eight races uh, of my car racing career. So uh, we have a situation where it was in the t deep end. Obviously you worry uh, because you are not really sure of yourself. I was quick, but I wasn't particularly safe necessarily. I was a bit on the edge because I'd, I didn't know totally what I was doing because I was very much that new boy. But uh, that relationship with the car and with Colin Chapman, he was a great character and he, it was a great car. The Lotus 18 car, uh, you know, was the competitive car probably of the time. And the stupid thing is I probably look at it and think, well, probably in those first two drives, I drove the most competitive car relative to the others that I probably ever drove in my career. Uh, so it shows that some of the cars I drove I got wrong. Chapman was a, a real character and uh, another character who soon came knocking uh, on your door was Enzo Ferrari uh, and you went to Ferrari in 1963. Just describe what it was like working for him. You knew him personally. You were one of very few drivers to have a proper relationship with Enzo Ferrari. There's, there won't be anybody like him ever again, will there? Well, uh, I mean... Uh, Ferrari g came on to me, first of all, at the end of 1960. At the end of 1960, he came on and said, come to Maranello. So I went to Maranello and I saw engineer Keaty and, uh, and they said, oh, we have this driver, that driver, that driver, we are going to do this. And I thought, this is so big. I'm a new boy. I haven't got, frankly, the experience or anything else, particularly going into an Italian team to deal with this. So I said, no. They said, no. You, we do not ask twice. But um, this was after I had had to turn down the chance of number one at uh, Lotus because Colin Chapman offered me that and asked me who I would have as teammate and I'd chosen Jimmy. But this upset so many people in the team that I found the atmosphere was too bad and I had to leave. So I, I went to see Colin I uh, see uh, Enzo and said no, but at the end of uh, 62, uh, when the Lola, which we finished fourth in the World Championship with, uh, was uh, told that we couldn't have any more Cosworth engines, um, a Climax engines, sorry, Climax engines at the time, I went back and uh, that was it. But Enzo, it was a split character. When he was in uh, Modena, uh, he was like the king, you know, he ruled and uh, he'd play all sorts of funny tricks but uh, the favorite memories I have is of him sitting in the passenger seat, Peppino driving and me sitting in the back seat of his Mini. Not a Ferrari, a Mini. He was a great enthusiast for Izzy Gonis and the Mini and uh, we go off to his um, sea house uh, down on the Adriatic and spend uh, a, a day there and that was a time when you found a real Ferrari away from these pressures and all this sort of uh, situation which exists at Maranello. But um, frustrating. Did you ever manage to get him to take those sunglasses off? Uh, Has anyone, did anyone ever see him without the glasses on? Yes, I've seen him without the glasses on and everything else but it was all part I mean, uh, Enzo put on a great show. Um, in a way, I, I mean, he treated us all like puppets on a string. Uh, when he was back at Maranello, he was like a puppeteer, you know, pulling the strings and creating all the different situations. He was a great one for thinking that you motivated people by setting them against each other. Uh, and some of the antics he got up to were, was quite extraordinary. But the fact remains is he created you know, this fantastic uh, you know, piece of motorsport history. And for that, we have to give him tremendous credit. And certainly, you know, part of me, I suppose, always remained back in Maranello. What would he have made of today's game? Pardon? What would he have made of today's Formula One? Um, well, um, there's people of their time. Uh, he would not have fitted into today's uh, show uh, as such. 
I, I, when he died, I saw him shortly before it. Uh, I actually made a statement. I thought, well, Ferrari's finest days are yet to come because what you needed to do is harness that, you know, vitality and that design and everything else which exists within Italy, but you needed to bring in international elements. And with Ferrari, this was not so easy, but under Montezemolo, of course, he put together an international team with the best of Italian style and everything else, but with uh, some of the other attributes which some of the uh, British and the German content and the other nationalities involved uh, have brought to the team. I'm interested to hear your views on Michael Schumacher, of course. He won all those titles with Ferrari. Jody Schechter sat there an hour or so ago, uh, another man to win the world title for Ferrari like you, and he said Michael Schumacher was the best ever. Would you agree with Jody? Well, when I was at Ferrari, I was trying to bring change about. I was trying to introduce more. I introduced the first fiberglass bodywork. I got uh, specialized moldings who did the Lola work to go over to Modena and uh, we built the first fiberglass bodies. We also brought a number of other elements in, but that brought about opposition. Uh, and in fact, it ended up with me uh, leaving. But um, Michael uh, went there and became such a vital part of the team and together with Montezemolo and the support he had that he was able to be part of that international team and I think he did a wonderful job. I mean, when I go along and I talk to youngsters and everything else and say, one moment, it's all very well that people have all the negatives about Michael but the fact remains is that, you know, he created that relationship with the team which then related to the way the cars performed on the track and he got a job done. So you can't possibly go along and sort of go saying, oh yes, but this, but that. He did a wonderful job for Ferrari and uh, I, uh, I'm not so sure that he won't do the same thing for Mercedes. Do you think he should have come back? Only he can do. Everybody can make these statements. Only he, if he has it within him, uh, I think he came back into a different world. Uh, a situation where before he had been able to establish close relationships, out testing, come together with the car, tune it to suit himself. What he had to overcome was all that preconceived sort of reaction from the past. He couldn't come in and just do what he used to do because the cars had changed, the rules had changed, so it was a new learning curve. So uh, I wouldn't go along and sort of say, no, he shouldn't come back because, frankly, only he can make that decision. And I have enough faith in him to believe that he uh, would have had uh, confidence that in the uh, not too long a term, he can put it together again. At the same time, you know, we have a lot of super youngsters. I mean, this year's world champion. I've seen him coming through the ranks and watched him and both uh, the constructors and the, uh, the uh, drivers' championship was won by very worthy winners. What about the dirty driving? Because in your day, if you banged wheels with someone or shoved them over to the pit wall, they would probably have gone off the edge of the cliff and into the trees. He just couldn't do it, could you, back then? And they, get, was, they get away with it now. It's dirty driving. I think in some situations, uh, this was uh, uh, circumstances which all came together. I mean, you go along and what do you say about what happened with Senna, etc. Uh, and the post situations. Uh, I mean, you, you, through, t through life you always have this. Uh, there are some question marks uh, about certain reactions which have happened. I mean, there's question marks about what happened this year. Uh, I mean, uh, with Barrichello, etc. But on the other hand, uh, I uh, still think that, you know, no one's perfect and okay, he's made mistakes, but overall, uh, you know, he's, a pretty, he's been a pretty wonderful package for motorsport. Now, before, we, uh, before you go, John, I just want to touch briefly on, uh, uh, as a result of immense personal tragedy for you 18 months ago. You set up the Henry Surtees Foundation. You're here this weekend promoting it. It's had a lot of wonderful support um, and it's something you must be very proud of. Well, it was a support which created it. 
when we had the uh, service, we said no flowers, please donations, and we said donations for the Headway Charity of Tunbridge Wells. And people were so generous and they were so forthcoming that we said, well, you know, we've got to keep this momentum going. And with that, Charles March at Goodwood said, you know, come along, work with us uh, with the festival, and we put a charity extent. We then ran a cart event at Buckmore, which is very good. And then we came along with the Beaujolais run, uh, and we got uh, foundation uh, charity status. So what we're trying to do is uh, our project with Tunbridge Wells, we've virtually funded, but we're continuing with other head injury uh, programs and uh, also looking at air ambulance and uh, some programs relative to getting kids from the community to have a little link in with motorsport, but from a learning point of view. The fact of trying to use motorsport emotion to perhaps uh, create an emotion within these youngsters so that they want to get on a learning curve. So we give them a chance in a cart, but then go along a chance to pick spanners up and use screwdrivers and then get on to the data. It, it, it seems a, a very cruel way for you to uh, be able to put so much back in, but it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, operation. How can people get involved? How can people support it? Uh, well, they can support it by keeping an eye on what we're doing. We're going to have a number of events during the year, uh, which are all there's. There's booklets on the little stand, uh, and in fact, I think circulating here, which give us a good indication, uh, give a good indication of what we've done to date and uh, what we have in mind. So uh, it's um, you know worthwhile just to pick up one of those booklets and just see, but. Uh, I don't want to make it sort of hard work for anybody. The events like, you know, when we did the Beaujolais run, uh, that was great fun, you know, for the competitors and everything else. But, uh, and also for us, uh, we went out and I went back to Reims again and stood there where Toto Roche used to drop the flag and nearly get run over while doing it at the French Grand Prix. And uh, the event at Buckmore Park brought out some of the past stars, but all those young hopeful stars of karting and in junior formulas, they came along and turned out in strength and we had a wonderful meeting with a tremendous atmosphere. And I think, well, that's fine because Henry was always known for his smile. And uh, that's something which we want to continue. He'd love what you were doing. John, uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. We'll, uh, we'll let you go. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for a massive legend, John Surtees. Thank you. Thank you.